Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Joe Diley. I guess they thought I was lost, but I actually was here listening to the custodial talk. Um, it's funny, with custodial cardioplegia, that was a big practice-changing event for us. Uh, the TAG, utilization of TAG back in 2011 or 12 when we started was uh, another one of those events. So I'm going to start. Uh, it's the perioperative utilization of TAG in cardiothoracic surgery. I'm going to talk a lot about some case studies. This is going to be not necessarily TAG 101. It's going to be more practical case-based discussion uh, and hopefully uh, pretty informal. And at the end, we can, uh, we can have some questions and answers about uh, TAG questions that affect your practice as well. So uh, disclosures, I'm an education consultant for Atria Cure and Hemanetics. Uh, we're going to start with a case study here. So. Um, 84-year-old male transferred from another hospital on a Thursday night. He was booked as a to follow case on Friday. A patient was cathed on Thursday, had a severe LED lesion they couldn't stent. Um, no present chest pain, but uh, some frequent bouts of angina in the last few months. So this is a uh, frail uh, male with COPD. Uh, his coags, all his traditional coags are normal. He had a platelet count of 140,000. We ordered a TAG and a master review at Friday a.m. before this Friday afternoon case. Medications included aspirin, Norvess, Topril, Senecot, Tylenol, and Zocor. It's the only thing mentioned in his history. So we look at this TAG. This is a baseline TAG. This is from the TAG 5000. This is what we utilize at our practice. And uh, it's basically normal. It's following the normal curve that you see with the dotted line. It's kind of an average of in the software built in from all the uh, tags that they've had over the years. Uh, but this was what's interesting, and this is what we look at. We look at MAADP, and in this patient it was 20.3, extremely low. Uh, this is one of those patients that we have to kind of review the history and find out what's going on, what's causing this. Uh, did, did he not have an echo? Does he have some aortic stenosis or regurg, something mechanical causing this inhibition? Uh, but more or less, uh, what we have to do is get a, a more complete history. Uh, it turned out um, that this guy was on Plavix. Uh, he didn't know it. His wife did, though. Unfortunately for his wife, when we, we questioned her, we asked her, was he on Plavix? No. Uh, he does take, I noticed, clopidogrel that you didn't have mentioned here. So it's, sometimes it's the brand or generic names that confuse patients and families, but uh, we figured it out. Uh, and, I, and I'll refer to it later, but we kind of use TAG now as like a, a caution or like a stop sign in our practice. And if something's abnormal, we've got to figure out why and have a reason for it uh, before we proceed. So, so what we did for this patient is our typical protocol. Uh, the MADP was, uh, was very low, so we wanted to we check that on, we checked it on Sunday again with platelet mapping. Um, here you can see the R, the R value. Here is a little long. That's from the Lovenox effect. Um, you can see the aspirin at the bottom there, 88% inhibition. Um, but we basically follow trends with MAADP. That's the maximum amplitude uh, based on uh, the ADP stimulation that they put uh, when we do this, this, the testing. So for this patient, uh, typically surgeons like to operate based on guidelines. If you don't have TAG that you can utilize at your practice, you have to basically strictly go by guidelines. So guidelines for STS and, uh, and the American Heart Association before operating for cabbage or any kind of heart surgery, uh, Plavix and Berlinta you would hold for five days. That's the guidelines. Effient would be seven days. So this patient we would be operating on Wednesday if we didn't have the TAG at our disposal. So on Sunday as MADP was up over 40, so it's trending in the right direction, inhibition was going down. So it's kind of one of those timing things where if you wait too long, patients at more of an ischemic risk. So this allows us to operate safely from a bleeding risk standpoint, but to avoid the ischemic risk. So using that as an example, um, it's different in everybody how patients react to, me to medications. The pharmacokinetics uh, would be nice if everybody's half-life was the same but that's not the case. And typically, when they do pharmacokinetic studies, they're looking at healthy subjects. And we all know in heart surgery that these are not healthy subjects we're operating on. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if we could just look at the half-lives, predict when these drugs would be eliminated? That's not the case. 
And not even the ADP inhibitors are what scare us the most, really. It's the novel oral anticoagulants. They're not so novel anymore. So sometimes you'll see them in the literature as direct oral anticoagulants. But the Pradax, Eliquis, Serelta, um, causing havoc in the operating room for us. <clears throat> so clinical considerations. Typically, you know, perfusionists are a practice. They, they're more involved in the, in the whole perioperative care of the patient. It's not just intraoperative, they get involved with the postoperative care. They're also in tune with preoperatively what's going on with the patient. We kind of we kind of use a, the timeout at the beginning of surgeries in, you know, time, I, I like to talk about these timeouts that we do before surgery. So I think the perfusionists here would all agree, uh, or at least the surgeons believe that a lot of times it's a waste of time. Timeouts were developed to try to prevent wrong site surgery. Uh, turns out that di that's not the case. They haven't prevented that. But what they have allowed for is a time for uh, communication, clinical communication uh, amongst all the different players of the heart team, perfusionists, uh, uh, advanced providers, surgeons, anesthesia, everybody nursing in the room to kind of get on the same page of what we're doing in the operation. So, so clinical considerations. Um, the indication for the drug, can we stop this drug safely preoperatively? And when, when do we uh, proceed with surgery? So the first case was an example of, of timing-wise using a tag to, de to determine that. Uh, so what are the clinical effects that, that we're going to see in the operating room or even before? So in, in, wherever you guys do lines, I don't know if you guys do lines in the operating room or in a pre-op holding area, but um, cath sites, anesthesia lines, you'll see hematomas develop in these patients on medications. Uh, you'll see the intraoperative and post-op bleeding, which we'll discuss. Uh, and we all know the increased morbidity from bleeding. Um, infection, trolley, uh, transfusion-related acute lung injury. Uh, this is definitely the symposium uh, where everybody's aware of the problems with blood transfusions, okay? Uh, not only infection, but mortality. Uh, there's been a lot of push and this is what kind of drove the STS to, to change their guidelines and look at, at point-of-care testing to help uh, optimize patients going into surgery. Uh, certainly, this has changed our practice from that standpoint. The need for re-exploration in heart surgery is associated with a four-and-a-half times mortality. You know, TAG's been around a long time when they used it in trauma initially. Uh, everybody knew that coagulopathies equal death. Okay, so when you have a sick patient in intensive care after trauma situation, uh, coagulopathies are going to be a, a marker for, for high mortality. It's the same thing in heart surgery. Typically what, what kills a patient after heart surgery is either bleeding or my, myocardial ischemia, those two things. Stroke is like a distant third, but typically it's going to be bleeding. Increased stroke, pneumonia, ICU stay, it's another thing. Uh, that bleeding will cause. So what are the cost considerations with bleeding? The OR time, it's not just, uh, you know, it's a, the return to the OR is associated with the, the post-op mortality and morbidity, but uh, it's the staffing costs, it's the cost to the hospital of being in the operating room again. Uh, blood transfusion costs, 800 to 1,500 a unit. Staff fatigue, something difficult to measure. About I think it's about three years ago, there was a, actually more than that, out of Charlottesville at UVA, they had a study that anything, anybody operated on non-emergently after 3 p.m. had double the mortality. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that study, but it was eye-opening, and it's certainly probably related to staff fatigue. Uh, I, I would imagine that's definitely uh, a major contributor to that. But So reversal agent costs, you guys, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Praxmine, if you have it available at your hospital. It's a really good drug. We've used it a few times. We, uh, typically, it's not used in a cardiac surgical arena. It's usually GI bleed kind of thing. But if you had to operate on somebody emergently with Pradaxa, it's going to reverse the Pradaxa only. So it's not a prothrombotic reversal agent, which unfortunately, um, or fortunately, it depends how you look at it, the Indexa has just come out. I think it was maybe a couple months ago, and we don't have it at our facility. I actually am hoping we don't get it at our facility um, because it's going to be a big problem with cost, I believe, and when to use it. So we're looking at uh, this drug, Indexa, to reverse the other factor 10A inhibitors, Eliquis and Xarelta. 
Okay, so this is going to be, if it's not at your facility, if you're at an academic institution, you're going to probably have it. Um, and the problem with the, I'll just briefly kind of talk about this. The problem with this drug is that it will bind the factor 10A for about two hours. And, it, and it, after the infusion stops, you basically give a bolus and a two-hour infusion. When the infusion's over, uh, it comes back about two hours later. So if you don't stop that bleeding in that like two, three hour time frame, you're kind of back to square one. And then you're also $25,000 in the hole. So look forward to that. So other risk factors for bleeding. So these are, these are throughout like the Society of Thoracic Surgery. This is what we look at and this is what you should look at for any operation um, as far as a, uh, even from a perfusionist standpoint, looking at your patient's history. Uh, so older age patients, low BMI, it was something that I uh, talked with our surgeons weren't even aware of a couple years ago that this was new in the literature and this was something that was pretty well known that we weren't really all aware of is that low BMI is an independent risk factor for bleeding. Non-elective cases, and it's kind of a hierarchy there, emergent, more than urgent, and then more than elective cases are going to be more at risk for bleeding. If you do five or more distals, if you have a cabbage surgeon in your practice that likes doing five or six grafts, they're putting the patient at more risk. Uh, bypass time uh, is directly related um, with uh, bleeding. And a cabbage, if you do a cabbage on somebody less than 24 hours after MI, it's another independent risk factor for bleeding. But drugs are the most common cause of bleeding after heart surgery by far. Okay, so that's why we're kind of having this talk. I mean, TAG is, is something that you can utilize to, to do the, the tracking of this medicine, these medicines' effects. So you have your old school blood tests for coagulation, and they have poor sensitivity with modern meds. And if you look at how a clot develops when fibrin, once the fibrin uh, starts to develop and you're looking at the platelets contribution, all these tests are out the window. It's really TAG is the only one that, you know, is, is going to be able to, to give you more information than these, a lot more. So, and tag with platelet mapping is, is a key for, especially with preoperative patients. So, when we look with tag with platelet mapping, we want to look at uh, two things really the increased inhibition of the platelets and also the MAADP when it's decreased. That's what, if you, somebody that's on Plavix, Merlinta, or Effian, that's the effect you're going to see on the tag. And it's really a validation of the efficacy of these meds because you will see it's consistent. And you'll see trends and you'll see the pharmacokinetics mimic what you'll see on the tag. For instance, Berlinta is, has a faster onset. It also um, has a, uh, it comes back to the baseline quicker than Effiant and, Pl and uh, Plavix do. Still a recommendation in the guidelines five days. When we take somebody off Berlinta, we actually see them correct sooner than than Plavix does. And also notice uh, on the tag with the MADPs is you'll, you'll see uh, significant lowering of the MADP and platelet inhibition will be very high on, on these IV meds, Integral and Kangrelor is being used a lot as a bridge now for people that have stents because it has an extremely short half-life, so you probably see that a lot. What's the other medication effects on tag? So heparin, Lovenox, Coumadin, and the NOAX, you're going to have a prolonged R. We don't consistently use, utilize TAG um, with the NOAX as a basis for when we operate or when we don't. We can't rule out that the drug's out of the patient, but what we can demonstrate is that the drug is still effective. Does that make sense? So we know if somebody's on Pradaxa and the R is prolonged, we know not to operate on them. But if it's not prolonged, we don't necessarily, can't necessarily say, oh, it's safe to operate on them either. Let go of my tag -o. You're supposed to laugh at that. So <laughs> other meds that affect platelet function. SSRIs, that's something that surprises everybody, but it really shouldn't. Uh, that, that's affecting serotonin. Also, what happens is you'll, you, you'll see this in OBGYN, if any of you worked there or worked in it before. Uh, patients complain of heavy menses and stuff with patients with SSRIs. You don't see the same clinical effect with bleeding, but they will inhibit platelet function, not to the effect of ADP inhibitors, but they, they do have an effect on platelets. Fish oil common and steroids is another thing. We see we get referrals or transfers from patients from uh, we're receiving facility from other hospitals. And patients are given steroid loads in the ER, and you'll see the inhibition on the on the tag. 
and it usually goes away in about 24 to 36 hours. So why the TEG? Uh, predict who will bleed. There's tons of studies, chest, chest tube output studies, a lot of those in the literature that show uh, a clinical effect that is very predictable based on, uh, on the TEGs, uh, the inhibition with the chest tube output that you would expect. So a surgeon can expect somebody to have a lot of chest tube output if they have a lot of platelet inhibition or a low MADP, and they're not going to rush to take that patient back to the operating room as, as they used to. Um, it could de the medication effect tracking, of course, but the de decreased time until surgery, that's a big thing that maybe the perfusionist uh, population doesn't appreciate because sometimes you're not following them every day up until surgery. Uh, you'll see patients get added on, but you don't necessarily know like if they're coming early because we're able to determine that the uh, ADP inhibition is, is out of their system at that point, but that's some something that the hospitals care about, patients care about. You're gonna decrease their risk of ischemic events by taking in the operating room safely in a timely manner. So goal-directed therapy to coagulopathy, that's the big bread and butter. I think perfusionists really can appreciate this non-shotgun approach to treating coagulopathies that uh, the TEG provides. Um, and that's been in the literature with trauma as well, not just cardiac surgery benefiting from that. But identify patients at risk so that you want to try to prevent those thrombotic events I talked about. We're going to look at a case study with one of those. Uh, resistance and responsiveness to meds. Plavix in particular, about 20 to 40 percent of patients have a, have a poor response to that. Um, consider tailoring medication regimens because of that. We don't have a lot of good randomized control studies that have demonstrated a, a, a major benefit by doing that, but it's mostly cardiology that has studied that there hasn't been a, a whole, there's actually only been really one uh, major study uh, with TEG with, after cabbage, but um, in general, it's, it's a common sense situation. If you had somebody that has a very young patient that has terrible disease and they came in uh, on an AD, on dual antiplatelet therapy, so aspirin and one of the ADP inhibitors, it's going to be uh, recommended that they go home on it even after cabbage if they came in with unstable angina or MI. So in those situations, if they came in on Plavix and they were resistant, it doesn't make any sense at all to put them back on Plavix. The cost, the, just the patients at risk still because they're, they're not therapeutic. So that, those are the kind of situations that are just a common sense effect. So uh, pre-op parameters, we always take the clinical situation into effect. Somebody is having crushing chest pain, they have a balloon pump in, still having chest pain, and that's not a situation where we really, uh, the, the tag will give us information, but we really have no choice in those situations. Um, so there are times to wait versus times to proceed. The tag platelet mapping contribution for the ADP inhibitor tracking is huge. Uh, this is a typical protocol. Okay, this is what we utilize. There was a study, the, um, I believe it was called the Target Cabbage, and it was looking at uh, time-based strategy. It's one of the original studies that ha helped develop a protocol. And they looked at MADPs. If the MADP was less than 50, they waited five days. If it was 35 to 50, they waited three to five days. And I believe if it was less than 35, um, excuse me, if it was less than 35, they waited five days. If it was greater than 50, they just proceeded the next day. And we kind of tailored it around this. Um, we like to, if it's less than 30, we don't just arbitrarily wait five days. We repeat the tag in two days and see what the trend is. If it's, if it's up over 50, then we'll proceed. So why do perfusionists love tag? They're less likely to watch the volume in the reservoir slowly ooze out of the PA's bloody leg. You guys have all seen that. Not hopefully as much as you used to, but. And this is an obvious one. They're less likely to be called in at 1 a.m. for a bring back. TAG's going to help you prevent bring backs re-exploration. Uh, it's, it's also going to uh, allow you to use less blood transfusions, okay? So you're putting the patient at less risk. But these, this, is, this is all, by the way, like a survey says situation. This was a, a poll I took with the local perfusionists and, and in past uh, lectures at perfusion programs. But the number one answer was this. 
the case is canceled, let the happy hour begin. And, and you know, this is, this is a situation where we laugh about, you know, the Friday afternoon, that one case of that, that guy that came in, the 77-year-old guy, he came in and he was put on the schedule, so he was gonna be a Friday afternoon case, but it wasn't safe to operate on that guy. He would have had, he was, we were putting him at risk by operating him on Friday afternoon for many reasons. He wasn't in an, an emergent case. So like I said, that th after 3 p.m. doubles the mortality right away um, if the case was gonna be done then. His, his platelet inhibition was significant and he was elderly with a low BMI and a lot of risk factors for bleeding. So this is, you know, it's, the, you know, perfusionist, this is the number one answer they say because the tag will cancel that case, but it's really, it's the benefit of the tag for the outcome of the patient that matters. I'm sure that everybody agrees with that. This next case study was a, a Jehovah's Witness, which sometimes, maybe not, puts fear in perfusionists. Um, this is a 68 year old male that was transferred urgently for a cabbage with active angina, and he had three vessel disease. His starting hemoglobin was around 10, and a pre op tag demonstrated the following. So this guy, this is that stop sign I put in here because it was one of those, okay, why is this guy's tag so abnormal? And you have to think that this is an important situation because there's a Jehovah's Witness with a starting hemoglobin of 10. Now it is only a cabbage, but um, there's numerous studies in the literature and that's why they came up with these guidelines that if some, you take some of the operating room on Plavix that's fully inhibited, you're gonna increase their mortality, all right? And they're gonna bleed more and you might be able to satisfy their needs for oxygen carrying capacity with you know, resuscitation of, with transfusion, but you don't have the option in this patient. Um, what the surgeon did in this patient is put a balloon in, he didn't have any angina. Actually, before we even put the balloon in, we put him on heparin and he, uh, he settled down. Uh, but what we did was the further history, looking into the history, this patient was transferred from a facility that, that uh, loaded him with Plavix, 600 milligrams as part of their chest pain protocol because it was a little bit away, about an hour from our facility. So you got 600 milligrams of Plavix in a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, you really want to try to cool this guy off with other means necessary before you take him to the operating room and put him at unnecessary risk. This is a Plavix resistance case study in a young, morbidly obese female who had an urgent LED revascularization due to stent thrombosis. Family history was very significant in this patient. The mother died on Plavix and baby aspirin after two stents, and the patient was very uh, knowledgeable about this, remembered this specific situation. Patient insists compliance for four months with the Plavix and baby aspirin. Uh, she had the thrombus opened with a wire in the cath lab. Flow was reestablished, thankfully. Patient was placed on heparin in addition to Plavix and aspirin. So now the patient's been on Plavix aspirin. They're on heparin. We get a tag with platelet mapping. And the MADP is high. It's 68 with only 12% inhibition. And the patient, has we've discussed, the compliance was there. Uh, compliance was confirmed with she was on aspirin, 80% inhibited. So what we did was we were able to operate on this patient the next day. Uh, we did a mid-cab, a robotic-assisted Lima LED um, off pump. The patient was ordered Plavix. We increased the dose, and then in a few days, we checked the tag to see what her response was to this new dose of Plavix, young patient. And it only showed 32% inhibition. MADP was 49 We were somewhat dissatisfied with that, but what happened here with this patient is insurance, sometimes our efforts are thwarted by the insurance company. So the, the insurance would not pay for two doses of Plavix a day. And obviously, I don't know if you guys are familiar that Berlint is a lot more expensive than Plavix. Um, we ended up giving her samples of Berlinta, we, and we checked the tag the following week to see if she was inhibited on that, and she was. Um, by this time, all this happening, you know, she was about two weeks out of surgery. So we weren't as concerned with the bleeding risk, but because now she was significantly inhibited. But um, this goes to show that if this patient were to be continued on Berlin to long term, which she wouldn't, we would put her on it probably for three months. Uh, but if she were to be continued on it long term, um, the insurance company would be paying more money. 
So therapeutic zone. This is a, an older slide, but it's a great slide. It kind of gives you the uh, that th so-called therapeutic window that you want to aim for when you're treating patients. As you go to the right, uh, you're, when the MADP is getting high, uh, and it's, you can see how at the end of that curve, the, the risks of thrombotic or ischemic events goes way up. And this is across the board in many different fields of medicine. We're talking about a lot of neurovascular uh, studies looking at stroke, stroke rates after interventions and stuff when they, they look at this as a, as a, uh, a guide to therapy. Uh, bleeding risk on the other side. So this, the patient we were just talking about fell somewhere around here in the middle of the curve. So she, she wasn't older. She didn't have a low BMI, so that she didn't have some of the other risks for bleeding. Um, but in general, that green zone is where you want to be. I, we always talk about, we have, surgeons ask this all the time. If you had a stent done, um, and you were placed on Plavix, wouldn't you want to know if it was working? Because if you have a, a drug-eluting stent and your risk of having a re-instent stenosis or thrombotic event after that is way up if you're not on dual antiplatelet therapy. And that's why the guidelines are like that. So if you had a stent, we always ask ourselves, would you get a tag to get it checked? And the answer is yes, and it's obvious. So it's, when things are that obvious, it's... Uh, it's kind of amazing when people don't understand or utilize this technology to me. So, if it's available. Um, this is a case study. This is one of those uh, cases we had in our early use with TAG that we, we, we failed to help this patient early on because we weren't really utilizing the TAG to its full capacity. This is a 52-year-old male status post of cabbage times three. Had good vein quality. Targets, however, were on the small side. And his baseline tag shows uh, a hypercoagulable state. You know, when, they, when you look at, like, for instance, like a trauma service, they don't really are, they're not really caring about hypercoagulability. And sometimes, you know, we forget about this when we're giving PCCs and things of that nature in a coagulopathic patient. Three days, four days down the road, if they do do okay, they're, you know, they're on the floor, and a lot of those patients get some uh, th situations like DVTs, and uh, ischemic legs, things like that. They get thrombotic events that you guys might not totally be aware of unless you're following these patients long term, but there is consequence to treating coagulopathies very aggressively um, because they do become hypercoagulable. But in a pre-op sense, this is what we're looking at in a patient. This patient's very hypercoagulable. MADP was 81.5, and I have looked at thousands of these tags at this, at this point. And uh, this is one of the highest ones I've seen. The presented emission zero. Um, the G value or clot strength was extremely high at 21. So uh, this guy basically had a, like a target on his back to have, he was gonna be at risk for an event, okay? And we kind of we missed this opportunity uh, because after surgery he did have a, he had a, a, an acute MI. He had an early vein graft closure. It, was, uh, it wasn't an acute MI, excuse me, it was evolving MI. Uh, it was having major ischemia. And when I want to go through this, uh, this cath here, this red here, this is where the, the graft had occluded with clot. So all down here was all clot. And this, this yellow down here, this yellow arrow, is designating the wire that he was able to get through. And he was able to basically fish out all the clot. It was an amazing job by this cardiologist. These blue arrows are showing the target vessels. So you can see that he had small targets. This was somewhat of a mismatch, even though the vein was fairly normal size, he had somewhat of a mismatch here, but the, the, uh, the big problem was his target size and his hypercoagulability, as noted on the tag. So what we did is after he got this graft open, uh, he was placed on effient, and uh, at the last time I checked on this guy, he was six months out, and he was event-free. So. so aspirin, can't forget about aspirin, and we, since we screen all these patients, uh, um, over 80% of the patients that are referred to us for heart surgery are already on aspirin. So we can basically demonstrate, you know, are these patients uh, inhibited fully, and what dose of aspirin they're on, and potentially tailor it. So we look at the aspirin response, uh, or excuse me, aspirin response is associated with early saphenous vein graft occlusion. That's a major independent risk factor for, for problems with the uh, cabbage grafts. 
And aspirin monotherapy is currently the standard of care in, uh, for antiplatelet therapy for cabbage. Um, considering the increasing the dose of aspirin if it's insufficiently inhibited. So we look at all the patients for that preoperatively and determine a need. Here's somebody that was uh, only 30% inhibited. I don't know if you guys can see that. but So this was somebody that came in with 81 milligrams of aspirin. We would increase the dose in this patient. So new users, you get a new surgeon uh, to tag, and he's not used to using it come from another practice. There's a lot of turnover in this country with uh, heart surgeons, uh, a great need actually for heart surgeons developing in the United States. Um, so what do you have to have? You have to have support from colleagues with the tag with platelet mapping that have experience. And you want to review the tag with platelet mapping on Plavix patients with these new surgeons. You want to discuss the expectations of timing on non-responders. So if you have somebody that's not inhibited, you, you, they have to make a leap of faith when they first start using a TEG because they're, they're used to guideline. A lot, of, a lot of younger surgeons are going to be very protocol driven and think that this is not a good idea to take somebody to surgery like this. But what you have to do is basically track your first few cases when they're thinking outside the box, outside the guidelines, and you have to remind them of these results. So anytime we had a new surgeon, they're on Plavix, say we've waited two days and the tag is normalized, or they're just a non-responder, take them to surgery, document that case, document the chest tube output, show the surgeon, ask him subjectively and objectively what he saw in the operating room, and they're gonna tell you that they noticed that the patient was like almost like they were a Plavix naive patient, they hadn't been on anything. So failure is often remembered before success. So. They're not gonna remember those 50 cases that they did that everything was fine. They'll remember the one case where they were burnt. Um, fortunately, that doesn't happen. So what have we seen? The STS recommended this point of care testing to determine timing of surgery for Plavix patients in 2011 and 2012, and that's when we adopted it. What are the expected results? This is, if you do utilize TEG, this is what we expect to see, and this is what we saw. Decreased FFP usage, decreased uh, packed red blood cell usage. You, you may see an increase in platelet usage because you're, you're basically going to find when you start utilizing this technology that the patients really, most of their problems are platelet function driven. Overall decrease in blood product usage and a decrease in re-exploration. You're going to have the ability to predict chest tube output and you're going to be able to help determine is this a surgical cause of bleeding or is this a coagulopathic cause. When we started in 2011, this is what we saw. We tracked it for about three or four years to see. This is blood utilization intraoperatively. You can see the, the PAC cells decrease, and these are all significant uh, decreases statistically. Uh, FFP was dramatic, and our platelet usage stayed the same. We had no statistical difference in our platelet usage intraop. We look at total units transfused intra and post-op combined, we saw the same trends for PAC cells and FFP, statistically different pre-adoption versus post-adoption. And again, our platelet usage stayed the same, essentially. So it didn't increase, but it stayed the same. It did not decrease. So this is a review maybe for the younger perfusionists or may maybe people that haven't utilized TAG or, or don't pay enough attention to it. Uh, when you're treating the coagulopathies, um, the prolonged R or bleeding from factor deficiency, uh, and you're not expecting hemodilution to be in effect here, uh, meaning you, we've had an uh, interaction or communication with the perfusionist. They did not have to hemodilute. You know, back in the day, there was a lot more hemodilution, uh, you know, priming the pump with tons of blood or, or volume. And, and the trend, obviously, in the last many years, we've seen hardly any prime in the pump. So the dilution from the perfusionist uh, culpability standpoint is nil now. I mean, it's usually an anesthesia's fault. Everyone agree? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> anyway, uh, if you have a prolonged R or a factor deficiency, you're gonna treat that with FFP. There's some numbers there from a protocol standpoint, but when you have a, a pre-op MADP that's low, you won't get that platelet mapping in an intraoperative TEG situation, okay? The MA is gonna look at platelet function but not 
related to, to drugs uh, when you're looking at an intraop. So that's why that pre-op MAADP is very significant to look at. But if that's low and you have an intraop low MA and you have bleeding, the treatment's going to be DDAVP and then platelets. And how many units of platelets depending on how much bleeding and ha what degree of platelet dysfunction you have based on the MA, the maximum amplitude there. The angle, uh, the angle's interesting. When we, they kind of refer that to that like thrombin burst, you know, when the fibrinogen's going to fibrin, and uh, they look at it as, they call it a functional fibrinogen. So you don't really need ever to order a fibrinogen level unless you're up in the ICU past there or a patient has like liver disease, you can assume something like that's gonna be low fibrinogen, but we really don't ever get a fibrinogen level. We'll look at the angle. Um, and if they're bleeding and the angle's low, uh, we don't, typically you won't see a, a, an angle by itself low. It's usually accompanied by other things. And FFP, if you had a prolonged R and, a, and an angle that's low, we typically will just give FFP because it does uh, have some fibrinogen in it. Usually it will correct the angle. But low angle's uh, a sign of low fibrinogen. Post-protamine, post-procedure, really the one thing is when you're looking for, you know, if you have heparin rebound or uh, too much heparin still on board. We look at the uh, CKH and versus the CKR. And if the R values are greater than two minutes apart, meaning that you still have uh, the sample that has the heparinase in it, if that's totally normal and the other sample without the heparinase is prolonged, then you know you still have some heparin on board, so we'll give protamine. Just a quick raise of hands. Does anybody in their practice do protamine drips after surgery? Like patient go up on like say 25 milligrams an hour for six hours of protamine. Does anybody do that at their practice? Two, three, four, five people, okay. Now real quick, another raise of hands. Does anybody agree with that? One emphatic uh, thumbs up. So it probably doesn't do a whole lot of harm. Um, I think heparin rebound, and I, we could talk about this at the end, may be underappreciated, especially in obese or long pump run patients. I don't know. We, we can discuss it. But in general, the, the tag can be utilized to, to make that determination. And it also is, is certainly going to help with re-exploration decision making. If we have somebody upstairs that's bleeding significantly and they, we haven't really even given them a lot of blood products yet and their tag is, is squeaky clean, they're probably going to have to come back to the operating room sooner than later, and that does help. Otherwise, we're going to treat the coagulopathy first. Theodore of York, this, you know, I'm looking, I'm right around probably the median age in this room, but this is kind of dates it a little bit, late 70s, Saturday Night Live, I'm a big Saturday Night Live fan. And Theodore of York, you know, one of his philosophies was that what patients need is a good bleeding. And he really thought that this was an innovative way of treating patients that came in with a headache. He would cut them and bloodlet them for about two liters and then say, you're, you're fine, you'll be fine tomorrow. That was his idea. So we all know, especially in perfusion land, that this is, this is something that's been proven in the literature in the last 15, 20 years, maybe even longer, that that's not the case. Especially in the last five, six years, it's been a big push. So can you trust the TEG? This is a case study. Uh, this was a surgeon that had really not a lot of experience with the TEG, and um, I remember this case. This is a post-op aortic root replacement. Patient had some stenosis, mostly wide open AI. Uh, low BMI, 62 kilos, 77-year-old male, so he's higher age. MADP uh, pre-op was 26, and percent inhibition was 51. The patient wasn't on any ADP inhibitors that we saw. And traditional coag measures were normal, pre-op, platelet count 151. So the first 30 minutes after closure, there was 125 cc's in the atrium upon leaving the OR. So finish closing, gather everything up, get them out, there's 125 cc's in there. Not very alarming for an aortic root replacement, I think we all would agree. Uh, the warming tag and post-protamine tag we were looking at are similar and they're as follows. So I put this arrow up there. It says collected at perfusion or by perfusion at uh, at 1:04 p.m. Okay, so we typically start cases at around eight. So this was a long case. Um, the next thing you notice is the R value of 
for a long case, that's pretty good. And we, we, we will, one of the things we do with perfusion is taught when we, when we do a timeout, we actually do a warming tag timeout. So when we're warming, we do a timeout with perfusion. We want to know how many pressers you guys are on. You use a ton of Neo. Uh, what are the, the last lights? We want to know what the electrolytes are. We want to know if the warming tag's sent. And this is to, so an, anesthesia is basically awake, number one, but also we want them to get their drips ready for coming off bypass. We want, so there's a, there's a full line of communication with perfusion and anesthesia and the table at our, at our center. Uh, and we do this a, as we do at a warming timeout, and the tag is an essential part of that to make sure it's sent. So we, we have real-time data in the operating room. So the tag's sent out, but everything's communicated in real time as it's going on with a tag in the, in the, in the operating room. So we look at the R is long, the MA is low, 39, and the G value is low. So the overall clot stank is very low. But the surgeon did not want to, um, to give any blood products because we only had 125 cc's in there. So it was one of those situations where uh, we all kind of were like, uh-oh, this doesn't look good. You know, long case, old patient, low BMI, big case, and um, they were a high risk of re-exploration. Not just from the tag, but also just from the case and the patient's history. And MADP was a little low before surgery. It was another kind of sign telling us this patient's probably going to bleed after surgery. So the next hour, the patient had 300 cc's, then 375 cc's the next hour, and we started giving the products, uh, starting with the DDAVP and platelets. Um, patient was brought back for bleeding. He had a liter of blood in after about four hours. So we, we did have to bring him, bring him back, excuse me, and it was mostly just coagulopathy. And um, that's, you know, he didn't have any surgical bleeding. So how would you treat this bleeding patient? This is, again, for people that real. this is the tag 102 kind of part of this. But So you have a warming tag here. I know not everyone's fond of the warming tags, and sometimes the timing's not right, but we've managed to utilize it to our advantage at our center. And, and um, MADP here was 42 pre-op. Um, this warming tag has an R that's normal, an angle that's essentially normal, an MA that's on the low side with a G on the low side, okay? We actually, I showed the protocol that we utilized earlier for, for transfusion in this situation, and this patient's bleeding, so they're gonna need DDAVP and one unit of platelets. So less than 45, we typically go with one unit of platelets if they're bleeding, and DDAVP always first line. So pre-op tag case study two, uh, this really is, is, is an example of, of a Pradaxa effect on TAG. So this patient was transferred for elective surgery, had a VSD and an LV aneurysm and a two-vessel coronary artery disease. So if you're gonna have a VSD repair and some kind of left ventricular aneurysm repair, door procedure probably, and a cabbage. So creatinine clearance was low, 45 mils a minute. Um, patient was on Pradaxa seven months ago for a DVT, had no PE. Uh, I put this in here because really, the treatment for DVT with no PE first occurrence is six months of treatment. So this is, a, this is an example of a patient that was really outside of the line of treatment for DVT anyway. No AFib, presently had no DVT. Cardiology said the Pradaxa should be gone. So the last of, dose of Pradaxa was three days ago. TAG was ordered. Traditional coags were normal. We don't have a Eastern test at our facility, um, so we weren't able to look at that. But this is what we saw. So MADP was normal, plain inhibition insignificant, and it really won't, the NOACs don't affect the MADP. It's not something you'll look at for that. You're looking at the R, okay, because they're gonna deplete factor either 10 or 10A, so they're really the start of the clot where you're gonna see fibrin strands, stuff like that. When the cl clot starts to develop, that's where it's gonna be prolonged uh, from Pradaxa. So this patient's R was 14.5, which is high. So we waited, um, this is now a couple more days, six days after the Pradaxa dose. Now Pradaxa is 80% renally cleared, so this is something that we, you know, the patient had creatinine clearance that was low. 
So we're definitely concerned about taking this guy to the operating room to uh, an elective case to repair a VSD and also do a door. So seven days, so six days we look at the, uh, the R is still prolonged. It's 14.4. And then the medicine's out of him by seven days, post, or seven days after Perdaxa. And that's, a, that's around what the guideline is for it. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. But you can see this is one way, and Pradax is actually, the, uh, this is, I'm not condoning to track the NOAX with, with TAG, let me make that clear, but we do, uh, fortunately for our inpatients, have this ability to look at it. And Pradax is one of the meds that traditionally we found uh, the TAG does do a decent job with. So the timing of surgery. So for, for the NOAX, there's no guideline-based STS guidelines on these drugs. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Um, they have some pharmacokinetic stuff in a, in a generalized surgery setting where it was actually, the, most of the literature was done by GI doctors and stuff, but they look at uh, pharmacokinetics only to make these uh, assumptions on. And for, <clears throat> for instance, high risk of bleeding with a normal uh, kidney function it says wait two to four days for Perdaxa. That's in the upper right-hand corner here. So this patient didn't have normal creatinine clearance, but maybe the cardiologist just has in his head, Perdaxa, wait three days, you're fine. Okay, so it wouldn't have been fine in this case. And the creatinine clearance was abnormal. And in this guy, um, it would have said to wait four days. And we know after looking at the tag, that wouldn't have been a good idea. So there, there was a study um, last year out of Germany that looked at bleeding risk after NOAX. And what they concluded was they basically found like tons of morbidity if they operate on these patients sooner rather than later. So an elective case, they actually went with a very conservative approach of 10 days recommendation on any elective heart surgery that's on a NOAC. Which is, for our practice, we, we've just actually came up with a new protocol for this, um, and it falls somewhere in the middle. Large volume centers like Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, they recommend adding one to two days during, to this recommendation. That's based on this, uh, this paper. I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 or 13. And so, so most of those centers, they recommend for the, for the Perdaxa, Eliquis, and uh, Zarelta, waiting uh, somewhere around seven days, if you look. Whereas that's somewhere around the Rhine where we fall into, into play there. So I look at this as a, something at one of our hospitals that I took a picture of years ago. It says, remember all these patients that get any plate the treatment on discharge, okay? Any of the interventional patients. And it's just, this is a reminder to me, this is two, twofold this slide. The first point is all these patients that are coming to heart surgery, probably about 20 to 30% of them are on ADP inhibitors nowadays. And basically all of them are on aspirin. So just the ADP inhibitors alone, you're looking at 20 to 30% of your population, okay? And much less to a degree the, the, the NOACs, but there's still a great deal of them as well. Um, and AFib has been in the literature, in the heart surgery literature, it's a very uh, active topic right now. So more and more push to treat AFib, you're going to see patients come in with these anticoagulants. So this was the EP, um, this is an EP note that I took because I was there, or EP note that I took a picture of. The patient, one of our patients had a pacemaker, so successful DDE pacemaker implantation, continue Sotalol, no heparin, Lovenox, Eliquis for 72 hours. Resume the Eliquis 72 hours after a left pectoral pacemaker pocket is site is benign without hematoma. So we kind of laugh at this. The, we do heart surgery on somebody, crack their chest, do you know, two valves, and they want us to start anticoagulating them you know, 48 to 72 hours after surgery, but they do a pacemaker and they're really weary about that hematoma in that pocket. So from a heart surgery standpoint, this is like a, something that makes us uh, a laugh. So just to sum things up to so the last slide, 
commentary, uh, Taylor transfusion strategy equals less transfusion. That's the mainstay of the tag. That's the benefit you're going to see. So if you're new to tag, um, you're going to see clearly less transfusions. Quality improvement initiative to decrease a patient's risk of bleeding, but also prevent future ischemic events. So that's one of the reasons why I'm up here talking today. Kind of make you guys aware that it's not necessarily just everything in the operating room to prevent bleeding, but also, you know, there's the patient preoperatively and postoperatively we're worried about, you know, clotting, ischemic thrombotic events, but also prevent bleeding going in. Patients with non-responsiveness to drugs are linked to increased MI stroke and other cardiovascular events. That's important to know, particularly aspirin, okay, because it's uh, the forefront of therapy after surgery. And if they're not responsive to aspirin, they're going to be at a higher risk of early vein graft closure. And that's the bread and butter of heart surgery still. So while screening patients for preoperative bleeding risk, we've been able to identify potential non-responders, and we've personalized the treatment despite no guidelines on that for patients, uh, because it's a common sense approach to, to help optimize outcomes. Simple as that. Um, there's not a evidence to the contrary. It's just a lack of studies to demonstrate. Uh, tag with platelet mapping has helped us exceed guideline expectations in patients on ADP inhibitors. As, as I showed in that first case study, take patients to the operating room sooner, and it's also decreased hospital stay for those patients. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm ready for questioning.